Vi har vel nettopp hatt et eksempel på et bevis på kapasiteter fra den andre siden av Atlanteren. I Europa har vi en meget kjent og produktiv mann i UFO-miljøet. Vi går over til neste programpost som heter «De aller nyeste bevis på at utenomjordiske besøker oss». I den forbindelse vil jeg gjerne introdusere titelen «What are UFOs? What do the governments really know?» Is there a cover-up? Altså en tilsløring, hemmeligholdelse. Michael Hesemann is internationally known as German's most profilic UFO expert. He has studied cultural anthropology and history at Göttingen University. He lives in Düsseldorf, Germany. And since 1984, he published magazine 2000, which comes out in uh, Germany and uh, the Czech Republic, and also in English in a circulation of 100,000 copies. His international bestseller, UFOs, The Evidence, The Cosmic Connection, and third, Beyond Roswell, and UFOs, A Secret Matter, were published in 14 countries with a circulation of more than 500,000 copies. Hesemann produced several award-winning video documentaries, such as UFOs, The Secret Evidence, UFOs and Area 51, Secrets of the Black programs in the US, including the X-Files, Germany, including X-Files. He traveled more than 300,000 in search of truth out there and was called the Indiana Jones of UFO research by the German magazine Amica. He lectured on international conferences in 22 countries of all five continents invited by the Human Potential Foundation, UNCET, the UN conference, the International Humanistic Society and the Ministry of Transport of the Republic of San Marino. And he has also lectured at more than 30 universities and in the United Nations. I am very proud to present Michael Hesemann. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'm very happy, very glad, and very honored to be in your beautiful city of Oslo here in Norway. Can you hear me? Is the microphone good? No. Can somebody turn on the microphone? I can, I can put it higher. OK, I'm, as I say, I'm very glad and very honored to be here in your beautiful city of Oslo. Can you hear me now? No. no? Can you hear me, Major Tom? Can you, am I floating in my tin can? All the, okay. Planet Earth is blue and there's nothing I can do. David Boy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I, I want to start my presentation by giving you an overview over what UFOs are, about the main types of UFOs, types of craft. We got an excellent uh, presentation today in the morning by uh, my friend and actually my idol, Dr. Stephen Greer, about the political implications of the UFO phenomenon and about the approach to get them to move. But what I want to give you today and also tomorrow, and tomorrow I will show different material from the material I show today. So if you're here for two days, you will uh, see a lot of different material. I don't repeat my lecture tomorrow. What I want to show you now and tomorrow is evidence from all over the world, but indeed we are not alone. Filmic evidence, because a picture is more than a thousand words and a video is more than a thousand pictures, so you will really see them with your own eyes. Not, unfortunately, not yet flying in the skies of Norway, but will happen hopefully in the future, but at least here on the screen. So we start with an overview of the main types of craft you see in the UFO phenomenon besides of the triangular craft which uh, were very prominent uh, in this decade and I want to show you film number one please.
one witness was able to film a landed dome-shaped craft near Carp in Ontario, Canada. The small reconnaissance probes were photographed in Denmark and the U.S. from close range. Okay, the first type is the disc shape. In the craft, south of England, Stephen before. Alexander filmed the a telemeter ball flying craft. over a cornfield in 1990. We observed all over the planet small unmanned ball shaped ball sized football sized. This craft. spectacular footage was shot in June 1973 during one of the first flights of the Concorde. The luminous small object surrounds the supersonic plane and hovers for seconds in front of its engines. Cigar-shaped motherships were seen in similar frequency. The third type this of craft film was taken over Rhode Island in 1967. Big cigar-shaped craft. This photo was taken over Texas in the same year, or over Lake Onega in Russia in 1978. These films were shot in 1980 over Hagen in the Ruhr area of Germany. This official film with the Russian Space Agency was taken in June of 1992 by cosmonauts of the Mir space station. The other craft was a Sayut approaching the Mir. An identical object was photographed in June 1966 by U.S. astronaut McDivitt aboard Gemini 4. Hundreds of witnesses saw this cigar-shaped craft in April 1990 over Krasnodar in Russia. This film was taken in July 1995 in Mexico near the Popocatapetl volcano. And this cigar-shaped craft was filmed by Tim Edwards of Salidas, Colorado in September 1995. Experts who analyzed the footage came to the conclusion that the object is more than half a mile long. Mothership is surrounded by small, luminous craft. Another case from the year 1954 was even investigated by the British royal family. Okay, stop. About two years after Damsky, Stop. A UFO like his landed up in... Okay, I'll just give you an excerpt because communism, more and more generals, top-ranking officials of the former Soviet Union are willing to talk openly and in camera about their inside involvement into the UFO situation. One of the most outspoken one of them is General Gennady Reshetnikov, who was the commander of the Soviet air defense in the Far East, what means in the eastern part of uh, Siberia, the area between Tomsk and Vladivostok in the 1980s, and today is the commander of the Academy of Air Defense, of the Russian air defense in Tver. General Gennady Reshetnikov, in his function as commander of the air defense, investigated UFO sightings and landings in Siberia, including some of them in the Ar Arctic uh, region in Poland. And uh, General Popovich was able to get the 124 pages KGB UFO file from the KGB, from the Soviet intelligence. And in these 124 pages, um, which I got as a copy from uh, Pavel Popovich, and we published it in magazine 2000 in German and Czech, and with 124 uh, uh, pages, you have one case which happened in June 1989 of a craft hovering over a nuclear storage area of Kapustin Yar, the nuclear um, a testing ground uh, north of the Caspian Sea, for three hours. For three hours, it hovered over the nuclear weapon storage area. And after the incident, we found out but the code, the launch code of the weapons was changed. Actually, it took them three hours before they managed to get a MiG-29 to come from the next Air Force base and follow up the UFO. And when the MiG approached, the UFO was shooting straight up and disappeared.
exercise, three hours. It happened actually at midnight, and maybe we didn't find a pilot who didn't drink too much vodka at that time. So checking up all the pilots, finding one who is not drunk is a problem in Russia indeed at midnight. But um, at least after three hours, one came. We have a lot of protocols <coughs> from um, different Russian airports where you have UFOs on the radar screen in this KGB UFO files. You have pilot reports and the KGB UFO files. You have the communications and so on and so forth. Another interview we were able to um, do is an interview with uh, Lieutenant General, Four Star General Alexeyev, who is the head of the uh, Soviet uh, space communications, and he spoke about UFO encounters of the cosmonauts. Tomorrow, I will show you an interview we did with cosmonaut Vladimir Kobayonok, who was in 1981 aboard Soyuz 6, and uh, they had a UFO encounter. And he spoke in front of my friend uh, Giorgio Bongiovanni from Italy um, about his UFO encounter on board of a Soviet Soyuz spaceship. What you will see now in a moment is a remarkable event which happened in February 1997 when this Italian researcher and contactee Giorgio Bongiovanni was invited by General Shetnikov to the Academy of the Soviet Air Defense in Tver. And after a one-hour conversation between him, the general, and the head of the counter-espionage, KG, former KGB counter-espionage for Europe, um, General Roshetnikov gave him some of the material from the archives of the Soviet Union, which I show you right now. The second film, please. You see here General Roshetnikov. And we could select some material from our UFO department in Tver. And we could state that this reality exists. That they come to us with their craft and we would publish with your help. Yes, and I will have it published all over the world by my friends, ufologists, the press, and as well as in Italy. In this way, this information will reach the people. You'll see an excerpt from the we'll general think about it. Release the material. I ask you this with my heart. And now comes the material. This is a group Show now these documents promised to us by the general. The Academy. They are only a few, but they are important because a three-star general granted release of these UFO documents. This is a picture taken in 1953 by Valentin Ivanovic near the Academy in Tver. It's black and white, and it is possible to see the halo around the object. These extraordinary images were shot in 1992 also by Ivanovic in Tver in the countryside. We were told that there is a dimensional gate through which spaceships made of plasma come and go. This photograph of the 90s has been analyzed by military expert ufologists at the Academy in Russia. The film is in black and white. You can see how they materialize. These documents are genuine because they have been analyzed by these experts. You can see below the trees as reference points. This picture was taken by a civilian in Tver in 1991. These pictures show UFO formations flying in and out of the town of Tver. It happened in October 
1991 and it has been carefully studied by the military experts. We do not know if this material has been published in Russia. In any case, this is the material that the general had promised to give us. You can see a formation of spaceships on your left. This picture was taken in 1992, also near Tver, near the base of the Academy of the Russian counter-aircraft. These are various positions and enlargements of the same photograph. These are some ufologists trying out their cameras. <coughs> An amazing photograph by daylight taken nearby the perimeter of the military base on the 3rd of March 1991 by, the, by three young men. Actually, there are three young men belong to the base, points. to the academy. Such as the Volga River near the city of Tver, all these pictures were analyzed by the general and his staff. We can also see the person who took these pictures. We do not know whether he is a military or a civilian orphan. UFOs fly over the base and military people are able to take interesting pictures. This is the same picture seen through a blue filter, thanks to which the disc is seen more clearly. The enlargement and the houses are reference points. This is a photograph of the same sequence of 11 photographs taken on the same occasion during the sighting. Watch this. This, this could be considered a camera defect, but the video we are showing, which was taken nearby the base of Tver, shows that it, that it is authentic. You can see how these ships appear out of the blue and split into two separate ships. On the right, it, the material on the left, it is splitting, and another one appears on the right, which is splitting into two separate ships. A zoom shot. We are seeing the same footage again of the ships which are splitting into two separate ships and which disappear. I think we don't need the audio because you have a problem of staying in Korea and I'm afraid. So, I better explain to you. On the 4th of May, at 2 o'clock, the photo of 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 the photo. In the see how quick it is moving, it is leaving, it's kind of crazed. And this picture was taken shortly before, a few seconds or whatever before. So it's really traveling very fast. Yeah, you have a photographic expert who says that there's definitely no mistake in the film. It is not a, a bird, it is not a plane, it is not even Superman. 
but definitely an unknown flying object, a real physical object captured on film when someone photographed these two lovely people sitting there. This is a reconstruction because here we have a distortion. And you see the ring portion in the middle, so this is how it originally might have looked. And here are some parallel pictures, and other pictures taken also in Korea. See, the distortion makes something long out of it. Now comes the film. We had another UFO sighting. It was filmed by Reuters uh, cameraman. I, I got it translated. Believe me, I don't speak Korean. But there are Korean people even in Germany, so I got it translated. And here you have the object, how it originally appeared. It's how it originally appeared. It's not blinking, it is not a plane, it is not a bird, we see it is moving, it is not a star. And then suddenly, something happens. But the cameraman who filmed it, and you see what happened. Okay. Three, four. You get an enlargement in a moment so you can see it clearer. Five. Here's the highest one. It really came a formation of fleet. One, two, three. Here's the fourth one. A little bit dimmer. Of our planet, and here one object is approaching. Here we have a thunderstorm area, here another object is approaching. Keep these two in mind that it's glowing in the very moment it is entering the Earth's atmosphere and both go in a kind of parking position in the center of this thunderstorm activity and they stop. Parking position. So here we have three dimmer objects that will See a little bit later in action. Here you have some more approaching the same general area, but keep especially these two under control because they will move away in the direction from which they came a little bit later. And see what a beautiful triangular formation you have here, and here you have one too, and here you have the two objects in parking position still. These are thunderstorms. My friend Dr. Michael Wolf, from uh, whom you will hear later, he believes they are very interested in this thunderstorm activity because they were able to engineer the weather on their planet in this very wild and um, primordial weather condition, definitely a three-dimensional round object approaching the, um, this, uh, the, the space shuttle mission. The mission was to retrieve the Telstar satellite. Here we have the start of another space shuttle in April 1981, STS-37, starting from Cap Canaveral in Florida. And we see this booster rockets here. Afraid of the speed over the next minute. Solid Victory engine. like sign Second in the sky. And altitude 184,000 feet, downrange distance 184,000 feet high, 50,000 meters Houston high now. Loud. Shuttle over Brazil. Norway. Space here. Until we have switched to TVC2. Very loud now. Everybody should hear it.
We have an unidentified flying object. We have an unidentified flying object. Catherine Coleman reported. And in a moment, we will see Catherine Coleman, the American astronaut Catherine Coleman, floating to the window and observing the unidentified flying object. Of course, the transmissions were ceased right after. You didn't hear anything anymore from her for the next half an hour. Why? They changed channel. Catherine Coleman seeing her, maybe first, maybe whatever, you of all. We have an unidentified flying object. Interesting film. Back to Earth. We, I can tell you about indeed in the 1990s, we have the biggest waves of UFO sightings in the history of mankind. They came closer, cameras they wanted to film the objects, and indeed the pilots had them on the radar. And in two seconds, they increased speed from 280 miles per hour, what is about 430 miles per hour, to 1280 or 1830 kilometers an hour, 1280 miles per hour. So no terrestrial plane can increase speed so rapidly. At the same time, on the ground, people saw this object. This is a computer enhancement of this picture, which was saw before midnight, just two years ago. This beautiful object surrounded by lights. This is definitely not um, a terrestrial craft. He explained how it was flying, and this is the camera with which he filmed it. After this comes my favorite UFO film because it shows the daughter of the vice president of Ecuador dancing the Macarena. And she's a beautiful young uh, lady and you see the party, the party at the wife of the vice president's birthday. And here the Macarena played the music loud. 17th of February 92, this is the daughter of the vice president and I don't know why her brother who filmed it is moving the camera away from to the object in the sky, which you see here and you see later in an enlargement. I really don't understand it. She's much more beautiful. But anyhow, everybody got excited and filmed this orange craft. And this is the family of the vice president, former vice president of Ecuador. So even in the highest political circles, they had UFO sightings. 1992 at 7 a.m at a party and smell there and she spoke with people living around and they said yes the firefighters came with big nets and they catch a very strange animal and the rumors about the encounter of the three girls um, went to a famous UFO investigator and lawyer the most important lawyer in Virginia Ubirajara Rodriguez who immediately asked his police contacts and firefighter contacts if they know anything about a strange creature captured in Virginia. And they knew about it. And they knew about another creature captured in the morning. Actually, what happened is that these two creatures were brought to the hospital of Virginia. One of it died there. The second one here died. And they were later brought to um, the, military, the first military um, based in Tres Corazones and later to um, Campo Grande, where they not only have the bigger military base but also a very famous hospital. And um, the leading pathologist of Brazil, the same one who um, identified the remains of the Nazi. Uh, Don't believe us. Side it had like a horn or something sharp at the side here. I couldn't see their faces, I could just see it all in dark, dark black. Did you see the spaceship? Oz, and I was asking what Oz, and everyone was screaming, shouting, aliens and stuff. And I looked down there, and I just saw it was a piece of metal, those um, curved ones for the roofing. And the light, I thought the sun was shining on it, so it made like a line of light. And then I saw these little black things running across, and they had huge heads, and like big soccer ball eyes. And then I saw everybody running down here by the logs, and I, I 
I put my lunchbox down and went to see what they were looking at. So I got there and I saw this kind of a yellow yellow thing on the ground by the trees there. And then I saw these people, well not kind of people. They had black suits on jumping out of the um, top of the kind of a saucer and Okay, um, stop it for a moment. Stop it. Teachers, the headmaster, the parents, and 44 of the children came only to one conclusion. They really saw what we described here. We have eyewitnesses who saw UFOs over Zimbabwe the night before, even the area of the school. We don't have one adult witness for the landing. It was a very strange coincidence that on the very day when it happened, the teachers had their monthly conference in the headmaster's room, conferring and talking. There was not a single adult. There was only a little tuck shop, a little sweet shop, which was facing the school and not the swamp area on the other side of the school. And one of the kids was running and told the mother, who was voluntarily uh, serving in the tuck shop, and said, come, come, there's a UFO, there are aliens. And she said, pull my other leg. <laughs> she didn't want to believe it. She believed it was a practical joke because the children wanted to use the time and get the sweets out of the tuck shop. But not one single adult saw it. The reaction of the children was generally rather positive. We had some children who were afraid. We had some children who had negative dreams or whatever, but these were a minority. Actually, the bigger problem for the children later was that the parents didn't believe them. The one boy I mentioned who got this bedwetting problem didn't get it because he was afraid of his beings, but he got it because his parents believed he was a liar and he never lied to his parents. But his parents were very traditional religious people and they said, no, it can't be true. There's nothing like aliens and definitely not coming to your school. It can't be true. <laughs> so, you have a mass landing. You have a close encounter of the third kind in front of at least 64, 65 children. These are the ones they documented uh, after we went, and um, I interviewed 44 of them, this never happened before. You had good cases of UFO landings with five witnesses, seven witnesses before, but never ever a whole school. And the interesting thing about it is we have a cross-section, not even of the Zimbabwean population, but nearly of the world population. We had Oriental, um, Indian origin, children, black children, white children, everything. Nearly, nearly every race of the world were and representatives of a nice and intelligent way because they landed on the other side of the swamp. Nobody could run over there and get close to the craft and maybe get in danger. No, it happened. And in a moment you will see why I believe it is the same or similar craft like the ones filmed over Mexico, Tepotzlan, Mexico. Play a little bit of audio, the audio is quite funny. Okay. Now come two more minutes. I only need two minutes. Okay. And now comes the blow up.
see what we are able to do in the studio when we edit the film. And now you see it really looks like the Carlos Diaz craft from, from the underside, not from the profile. And you see these little lights coming out of it. Four, five, six, seven. Now when we watch with um, images, uh, I'm running out of time anyway, so I will give you a little conclusion at the same time when we watch these images to save time and at the end you will see computer comparison between um, these objects and the um, films from uh, Mr. Carlos Diaz and you constantly see little lights coming out of it. But if indeed we do have waves of sightings in the 1990s, like never before in human history, what does it mean? It obviously means that the UFO phenomenon is coming closer. There's a strategy behind it. There's definitely a strategy behind it, and a part of the strategy started in 1989 with mass sightings over many, many countries all over the world, including European countries, and more and more landings. And at the same time, a media policy which brings the phenomenon more and more to our attention, programs like The X-Files, Dark Skies, Men in Black, and so on and so far, including horrible propaganda movies like Independence Day, um, which uh, a director, uh, Emmerich, uh, actually was nominated by me for the Dr. Joseph Goebbels uh, Propaganda Film Award. And, um, because it really is some kind of Nazi propaganda, it's some kind of anti-alienism, and I was very tempted to uh, uh, start a new a UFO organization called the AADL, the Alien Anti-Defamation League. So maybe you know the same organization, but my brief, but uh, I had the idea of founding the Anti-Alien Defamation League. So what does it mean? means that indeed in the future we will all realize we are not alone in the universe. And this realization can cause the same kind of effect as 500 years ago the realization that we are not the center of everything. 500 years ago we had the Copernican Revolution. And the Copernican Revolution caused everything from the reformation of the religion to the beginning of the age of science and the age of discovery. It also marked the beginning of a new form of government. No totalitarian um, monarchy, but a step in the direction and later real democracies and republics. We did have a development over 200, 300 years following to it, which really formed our society. The age of discovery. The sailors were not afraid anymore, but Earth is a plate, and at the end of it, you have to be very careful not to go too far, because there comes the big abyss, and in the abyss, the dragons dwell, and eat the uh, brave and too brave uh, sailors. No, you really realize how big this planet is, and you found areas, lands, where no one has gone before. So if you realize you're not alone in the universe, what will it mean? It will cause a new Copernican revolution. It will cause a new definition of our position in the universe. And one of the most important points of it is that we will realize we are one mankind. We are children of the planet Earth. There's no real difference between Norwegians, Germans, Americans, and whoever because we all have the same common origin. We have the same common ancestors. We have the same vision of the future, and we have the same experiences of the past. So if we realize this, it will cause a lot of trouble and change. You can turn the light on. It will cause a lot of trouble and change for those in power, because nationalism is their game they want to play. Because behind nationalism is the idea of defense of countries which bring so much money in the pockets of those 
who are in the weapon building industry. If you realize we are one mankind, we don't need the weapons anymore. Indeed, we know then, but only together we can take the great challenges on the threshold, turn it off, turn the light on, on the threshold of the third millennium. We will realize, but indeed, we can form a much better society on our planet together. We can solve the global problems much better together. We can overcome things like overpopulation, things like the greenhouse effect, like the ozone layer problem, and so on and so far together. And we can make the final step back home where originally we come from, the final step out there to go where no one has gone before and to meet our relatives who are already flying around there for thousands and thousands, if not millions of years. And we will learn a lot. We will learn a lot from this contact, from this communication. We need a communication or comfort. We don't need Star Wars. What we need is a dialogue with the universe. And with this vision for the third millennium, which is approaching faster than you and me can, can even imagine, I mean, two years only, I mean, then <laughs> we enter the year 2000, two years and two months, and we enter the year 2000. I mean, this is the vision for the third millennium, a peaceful society on Earth and a great challenge to build up one mankind and to become a member of the family of space traveling planets, to join the club, to join the brotherhood, and to realize that our true home is not only down here, but also out there. And we will find out things we can't even dream of today. We only have to take this very single step. And what can cause a revolution like the Copernican Revolution? What caused the Copernican Revolution? Galileo Galilei said, look through my telescope. And the arrogant dinosaurs of ancient science and religion of that time that were not willing to look at the evidence. So what I tell you now, how we can start a revolution is look for the telescope of Galileo Galilei, look at the evidence we have, but indeed, ladies and gentlemen, we are not alone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. Vi tar en pause i 20 minutter og starter klokken fire.